So good afternoon and hello everyone and welcome to today's session. It's a pleasure to present to a wider audience about the Scurio and uh, MultiPoint. Uh, today's topic is on the essential guide to dark web monitoring. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Um, I'll start off with uh, Jeremy, who's the CEO of Scurio and the other presenters are Sam Petit, who's the intelligence analyst. Uh, Ayub unfortunately could not make it. He's a channel sales manager for uh, Scurio. He just tested positive. And a brief intro about myself. I am the VP for business and operations at the MultiPoint Group. A recorded version of this webinar will be available. So quick rundown on the essential housekeeping. The mics will be muted, so appreciate that. You know, we would love to hear from you and I may request that if you can park your questions or drop in the chat box, which will be addressed by the presenters after their respective presentation. For those of you just joining us and likely to join in the next couple of minutes, welcome and let's start the proceedings. Um, okay, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, MultiPoint and, and uh, what our value proposition is. You know, MultiPoint, we've, the group was founded in 2009. We've got regional presence in, in Europe, Africa, and US. The Dubai-based office that caters to Middle East, Turkey, and Africa has been in uh, operation since 2020. And what we do over here is we, the idea of, the way we look at self as a value added distributor is that we design to cover market challenges and trends along with which makes it more valuable to our partners, vendors, and their customers. So what we do is we not only impart knowledge transfer along with the solution, but we're also at the same point of time focusing on coverage and uh, also on cybersecurity solutions. Sorry for that. In IT management, industrial sector, OT, uh, IT asset and cost optimization. So as I mentioned that this is where our regional presence are. So I'm just gonna flip through those slides. Now, this is what I call it as our areas of practice. So what we do is we actually uh, cater to all the different, the key elements, which is into security, consulting and ICT network, uh, as well as what we also take pride is we also impart knowledge. So it's what we call it as a self-assessment. Now, these are the different vectors and areas that we actually apply our, our trade. So into endpoint security, data, data classification, email security, to name a few. In terms of our networking, we're into application monitoring, data center monitoring, OT network management. Uh, in terms of consulting, it's in uh, software license optimization. And one other element that we also take pride is uh, we impart knowledge and we've got our own professional services that not only looks after the cybersecurity consultancy, but it also, also provides other services. Now, why I, I want to actually touch base on this is because we, we believe that um, you know, certification micro-credentials for the entire staff comprises of three essential concepts, which is thing built and secure. So our cyber strategy is that balance of people, process, and technology. We also take pride with our key vendors and partners. And, the, and as I mentioned, these are some of the highly profile names that we actually uh, we, uh, uh, distribute within our regions. A couple of uh, important points here is we provide governance risk and compliance portfolio for ISO 27.1, SOC risk analysis, as well as the cybersecurity training for the first responders for in in terms of the uh, to reduce the time and identify the problem. So in a way, what we also do is we can call it the blue team certification of cybersecurity. That's all from my side. I try to be as concise as possible with our uh, corporate profile. And now what I'm gonna do is hand over the stage to Jeremy and uh, Sam for the main topic of today, which is in terms of Scurio and what are the value proposition. So over to you. Thanks, Naresh. Would you mind um, on sharing your screen so that I can present? Yes, please. That'd be great. Thanks. Give me a second. Perfect. Thank you. All right, perfect. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jeremy Hindi. I'm the CEO here at Scurio. Uh, I'm 
joined today by um, my, my colleague, Sam Pettit, one of our threat intelligence analysts. Uh, apologies from Ayub uh, Riahi, our uh, channel sales manager for the region, who's uh, unfortunately off with COVID today. Um, just a very quick intro to, to Scurio, because I want to make this more of a, a technical session, but um, we're, we're based in the UK. We've been uh, operating for 11 years now, and um, we've got a SaaS platform that does digital risk protection. So that's cyber threat intelligence, data breach detection, and dark web monitoring all in all in one platform. Um, before we get going, we've got um, a little poll. So um, I know a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with the dark web. So just if you've got um, a few seconds to answer the question as to what, you know, what do you think are the biggest threats to your, your company from the dark web? You can um, uh, give us the answers. They're always good to see what people care about, what they think might be there in terms of, in terms of threats. Okay, so I'm going to, um, you know, talk a little bit about what's changed in the in the cyber threat landscape over the past few years. I think, you know, if we go back um, 10, 20 years, cybercrime was really quite highly targeted by, you know, specialist hackers um, getting inside the perimeter of typically, you know, large banks or enterprises where they can make a lot of money. And so to defend against that, people were really focusing on, on defending the perimeter of their organization with the firewalls, the SOC teams, the network analysis. Um, and of course, you know, until, until a few years ago, data breaches could sometimes be swept under the carpet. They wouldn't necessarily get disclosed, but there's been some fundamental changes <clears throat> to, to cybersecurity and the way we all do business over the, the last few years. So, you know, instead of expert hackers targeting every individual organization, uh, there's a lot of cybercrime as a service now. There's lots of automated um, uh, uh, exploiting of vulnerabilities. You can go and buy and rent the in infrastructure to do this very easily. You don't have to be very smart to launch a service anymore. And, you know, just like any other economy, um, cybercrime has got multiple layers in it, and it's now much more affordable for cyber criminals to target mid-sized and even small businesses because it's all automated. The, the, the fact that all of our businesses have, have, uh, are shifting to cloud, we've been through digital transformation means our data isn't inside the building anymore. It's, it's stored in the cloud, it's processed in the cloud, it's being shared with lots of third party vendors and supply chain partners, which you know, has made our products and services great for our customers because it means they're real time, they're 24 seven, they're available on any device, but it's, you know, it, it's driven the attack surface much wider outside the perimeter of what you can control. And so really what people are having to think about is as well as defending their own perimeter, they've also got to add in tools and capabilities to protect your data when it's out there in the supply chain. And particularly for those, you know, mid-sized and small businesses, they have limited budgets, they have limited resources. Uh, a lot of our customers couldn't afford a traditional solution with which required three or four threat intelligence analysts in-house and some very expensive tools. And finally, you know, from a consumer perspective, from our, our customer perspective, we're all as consumers very aware of data breaches. Um, there's new laws and regulations coming into place around the world to protect our personal data. The regulatory fines have gone up significantly. And, and certainly in, in some countries like the US and the UK, we're now seeing law firms being set up where if your data has been breached, you can claim against the company and get some compensation. So the financial consequences of a data breach are now very significant for organizations of all sizes. So, you know, it's, I, I think, threat intelligence, dark web monitoring, data breach detection, it's not just for the big banks and enterprises anymore. All of our businesses are targets, all of our businesses are vulnerable. Um, and, and that's really where Scurio's mission is to enable businesses of all sides with those kind of capabilities. And on this slide, you know, cybercrime is a trillion dollar industry. So the, an, an estimate there you see a little screenshot of is that it was $6 trillion last year, which is the equivalent of the third largest economy in the world. Um, so, you know, if you compare that uh, as a scale drawing, this little blue line here is on the same size as the, as the cybercrime. We spend about, you know, 4% um, of that on cybersecurity. So the world spends $150 billion on cybersecurity every year. Um, but the criminals are making six billion, so something's gone wrong there. And if you look at how much we spend on cyber insurance, because obviously a lot of us have got cyber insurance, we hope that will protect us when something happens. That's 0.1% of the what the cyber criminals are, are causing is covered by insurance. So, 
you know, it's it's quite scary to think about the size of the problem. And so we're going to, you know, talk in this this webinar today to understand, you know, what is the dark web? What's on it? Why should I care about it? And then how do I go about monitoring it? And most importantly, what what kind of things can I be looking for? So let's start off by kind of saying, what do we mean by the dark web? I mean, the internet is a very big place. There's lots of different um, sites and ways of accessing it. There's good content and there's bad content across the surface, deep and dark web. And so you can think about the dark web. Um, it's kind of a bit mysterious. You can think of it as being bad places, or it could be um, the anonymous access technologies like the Onion Network, the Tor Network we're gonna be talking about today, but also other channels like IRC, uh, internet relay chat telegram torrents and and there's you know lots of different sites so social media sites auction sites code repositories like like github and pastebin that are used you know generally for good purposes are also used sometimes for for sharing and leaking um stolen data or exploits there's a lot of um sites that then get progressively darker so some of the underground marketplaces that are focused on data breaches the paste sites and bin sites that can be used to anonymously exchange data the dedicated hacker forums and chat rooms that you need to be invited into um, some of those are on the surface web some of them are on the the onion network some of them are on uh, chat rooms on irc and telegram um, and of course the dark web also has some very illegal content on the the drugs the weapons um, the indecent images that, you know, there's a lot of really nasty stuff out there. Our mission is, is not focusing on that, but it's on the sites where people are, uh, are marketing and selling and leaking corporate data, which is uh, really what we're, what we're focused on here. So we can think about the dark web as either being, you know, the type of site or the type of network it's hosted on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tor network, the dark web, the onion router. Um, so if we, if we, Think about the the dark web from a technological perspective um, we consider that as being sites operated via tor or via the invisible internet project i2p they they work slightly differently but they achieve the same aim and that is anonymity and and the tor network the onion router operates through layers just like an onion to make the communication between the client and the server anonymous and um, just to illustrate this, this is some pictures from the, the Electronic Freedom Foundation about, you know, what happens if you're not use if you're using regular web and you're not using even um, HTTPS, the journey between your, your laptop and the, um, <clears throat> the site you're visiting, lots of people can intercept who you are, the data that you're, you're typing into the web forms, your usernames, your passwords, the sites you're visiting, your IP address becomes visible to lots of different people. So obviously turning on the, the security using HTTPS is a, is a no-brainer. It means people can't see the data you're typing in, but everybody through that chain can see what site am I visiting and what IP address am I located at. And of course the site owner can see exactly what you're typing in here. Um, what the Tor network does, and sorry, VPN, you know, you can use VPNs, which, which um, achieves some privacy from your local Wi-Fi network and from the ISP, but, but everybody else can still see what's going on there. So the onion route to the Tor network, what that does is add um, three layers of relay into that um, communication traffic. And now what that does is effectively hides the site you are visiting from your local network. So your ISP, your local Wi-Fi network can see that you're accessing Tor, but it cannot see which site you're going to. The Tor network itself is split into these layers, and so the entry point knows your IP address, um, but has an encrypted version of the site you're trying to visit, so it doesn't know the site you're visiting. And the exit node, this Tor exit node, um, only knows the site you're visiting, but it doesn't know your IP address. So effectively, it masks you um, from that site owner. It doesn't know where you are. The site um, you're accessing can't tell your IP address and vice versa. So the key thing about Tor is anonymity. It's breaking that link between um, the user and the website you're visiting. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a free browser. You can download it. You can use it to access regular accounts. Um, your, your ISP or your company can see that you're accessing the Tor network, but it can't see where you're visiting. So as an example here, you see, you know, the BBC news site is available on an onion link on the Tor network. 
um, for people who want to access it in countries where the government is censoring the internet, um, as an example, but you can also use it to, to access regular websites um, using anonymity. So one of the things you can do as an organization, you know, one takeaway from, from this webinar, if you're in, in the uh, security team, would be to block the Tor exit nodes. So it's fairly easy to get hold of lists of these. These are the, the final um, IP addresses which may be accessing your servers, your apps, your networks. We'd recommend you generally block those um, because it's unusual for anybody to have a, a good reason to access your site or your app from the dark web, it's much more likely to be a malicious uh, actor trying to um, hide where they are than a genuine customer or a genuine member of staff that is using Tor to access your network. So we definitely recommend, you know, getting a getting a list of uh, Tor exit node IP addresses and adding them to your block lists at the perimeter. Let's talk a little bit about who uses the dark web. I mean, there are people who want to use the dark web for anonymity. So maybe they are a whistleblower, they're interacting with journalists, um, they've, they're maybe bypassing censorship in their, in their country and wanting to access new sites or social media that are blocked at the perimeter. It may just be people, you know, uh, teenagers who are curious about what's on, what's on the dark web, but, you know, equally, uh, a lot of people use it for illegal and illicit activities. Uh, not forgetting, of course, the intelligence analysts like Sam and his colleagues who um, spend a lot of time using it to, to, to help our customers understand what content is out there. So lots of different people use it. You know, what is out there? Well, definitely not everything out on the dark web itself is illegal. There's lots of content that's, that's the same as on the surface web, like BBC or Facebook um, or the New York Times. Uh, there's even radio stations if you want to listen to, listen, listen to jazz music. But the thing about um, the dark web is because it's anonymous. Um, if you're hosting a website, it's very, very hard for law enforcement to, to trace where your server is. If you're accessing it, it's hard for, um, for law enforcement to, to trace back to your IP address. So it makes it an ideal channel for um, people to, to host sites with illegal content um, and, and to uh, interact with those sites. So there's lots of different types of categories of site, the, the forums that will maybe ex explain to you how to go and hack an organization, how to exploit some vulnerabilities, um, sites that will sell you ransomware, people selling data. There's a lot of really bad content out there, you know, drugs, weapons. Here you see a screenshot of somebody who claims to be offering uh, hitman services. Um, a lot of scams as well, you know, a lot of these will go, are going to be fake. If you send one of these people some Bitcoin, uh, there are no guarantees, there's nobody to complain to, you know, you, you risk having your, um, your money lost um, and being, being scammed. But going back to, you know, what I was saying at the beginning, you know, the dark web, cybercrime is a trillion dollar business. It's like any other internet business. People have to advertise, they have to market their goods. And products. Um, here you see a screenshot of some work we were doing for a company in the fuel segment that was wanting to understand what kind of um, skimming hardware was was um, being deployed uh, for petrol pumps, for gas pumps. And, and so here's a, a dark website that's focused on skimming um, <coughs> for card readers, both at the ATMs, but also at the gas pumps. And so here you can see they're, they're you know, marketing a, a product. Um, you've got a list of features. You've got a choice of delivery methods. You've got um, you know, uh, a nice looking shopping cart. Some of these sites look like, look like Amazon or eBay. They're very professionally um, designed sites. They've got customer reviews and customer feedback because people rely on reputation just like any other part of the internet. So often this can be a very useful way to, to use the, the marketing um, the people are marketing of data or the products that are going to be a threat to your business as a way to discover those threats. And what we can see on this site is we've got lots of products advertised for sale. I've now got, you know, an image of this GSM based skimmer installed in a gas pump. So that's maybe something that's useful intelligence for the operators of the, uh, the fuel company to be able to say, okay, if you're servicing the the petrol pumps, let's look for this kind of equipment being installed, maybe issue a bit of a bulletin to their, to their staff to understand you know, what's happening here. Um, so keeping ahead of what the, the techniques that the bad guys are, are using. So let's talk a little bit more about you know, some of the threats to your business from, from the dark web. Ransomware has been 
a massive um, you know, uh, impact on, on cybercrime in the last sort of 12 to 18 months. We've seen a huge increase, particularly with COVID-19, everyone's working from home, it's harder to secure the network. We're, we're now monitoring 83 different ransomware groups. Um, the, a lot of them have got official um, websites for the group on the dark web, um, or in some cases the surface web, but normally the dark web. Uh, and there's also several market sites that are you know, selling ransomware techniques, um, providing uh, collated information about what data is out there. And, you know, in the, uh, in the old days, ransomware going back a few years, the only thing it used to do was to encrypt your hard drive and you'd have to pay the bad actor to, to unlock your system and get access to your data. Um, that, a lot of that has been mitigated because people are now using cloud backups and restores. If the hard drive's been encrypted, it's probably not a big deal if it's just an endpoint, you can restore it. So the new generation of ransomware that's been running for the last 12 to 18 months, they are now, before they, they turn on the encryption, they are also exfiltrating all your data and then saying, unless you pay us, we will publish that data. And then on their sites, we will name and shame, you know, they will name and shame your company. They will auction your data off if you don't pay the ransom and eventually maybe publish it for free. So the stages they're going through is to infiltrate your network. Um, so one of the things we can prevent with the Scurio platform is to, is to discover all of those compromised credentials that may be used by your staff um, that might be um, a way of them getting into your network in the first place to, to extract that information, detonate the ransomware. Um, but then in these stages where the, uh, the bad actors are starting to publish and leak your data to try and force you to negotiate with them, we can generate real-time alerts by monitoring those websites and detecting any mentions of your name on that. Um, and of course then, you know, once the data, if you don't pay the ransom, then breached information can get shared um, on, those, on those ransomware sites and then further shared on further hacking forums. And of course, the thing to remember about ransomware is it may not be you that gets breached. It may be one of your supply chain partners. So maybe one of your supply chain partners has, had a, has fallen victim to a ransomware attack the hackers have extracted all of their data, which includes yours, and that gets published on one of these sites. So, you know, the name, the name you may see um, on the ransomware site would be your supply chain partner, but the data that's published could be your contracts, it could be your employee data, it could be your customer data. Um, so here's an example of how, you know, infiltration happens. This was um, uh, an exploit uh, that, that happened um, uh, a year and a half ago, I think, from um, an, an, a vulnerability was discovered in VPNs. Um, the Revil ransomware group then uh, used this to extract a whole set of breach credentials that were being used to log in to, to VPNs and to log in uh, to customer networks. So, you know, unpatched VPNs. Uh, the the breach that that um, we detected included lists of you know the the administrator logins the IP addresses of the VPN servers privileged access that would let you get straight into the VPN and in some cases then you know go and execute that lateral movement so this kind of information floating around um, gets published on the on the dark web if your VPN gateway IP appeared in that list so, you know somebody can get into your VPN. So that's one of those examples where monitoring for your IP address would be a really good way to say, oh, okay, why is my IP address appeared on a dark web post? Okay, it looks like it's a VPN exploit. The next stage, you know, when, when the bad actors, when the ransomware groups are, are marketing your data, they're putting you under pressure. Here you see some screenshots of the Lockbit 2.0 dark website. So this is a ransomware group. You can see a, a list of victims here. They've got countdown timers to say, this is the time until the files have been published. Um, they've got a little description of what data is out there. But then if you're not paying the ransom, if you're not interacting with the ransomware group, they will, in some cases, just publish that, that, that data. They will provide a link to the file. They'll provide some samples. Um, and so here you see an example of Brick Affair, which is an Italian um, retailer, of a sort of DIY, DIY hobby retailer um, and they've just you know not paid the ransom and so all of those exfiltrated files have been put in the public domain but you can imagine if one of these companies was a is in your supply chain um, then you, you'd, you'd potentially want to know that they suffered a ransomware attack to be able to work with them uh, and here you see some examples of data that's been published uh, in this case by another ransomware group 
uh, they've published the data for um, Elite Mate, which is a dating app. Um, and, you know, they've just published a link to the file, uh, which is on an anonymous file sharing site. Um, you can go and download it for free. And it's a, it's a big long list of, you know, um, first name, last name, home address, zip code, email address, password, IP address, all of that customer information is now, now leaked out there. So, you know, that's some of the kind of things that are on the dark web. Um, Sam will be showing you some more in the demo. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the challenges of monitoring the dark web, well, the first one is identifying those dark websites in the, in the first place. They come and go all the time. There is no Google for the dark, for the dark web. Um, there are some directories out there you can find, lists of sites, but, you know, there was a big change to the dark web last year where um, the, the version two onion links that have been around for many years were, were made obsolete. They weren't secure enough for the bad guys. The bad guys were getting traced. So they've now completely changed the addressing system. It's much more secure. It's much more anonymous. And so as a result of that, a lot of those sites went down. They weren't being maintained, um, but you, you almost have to start from scratch in terms of understanding what are the new sites out there. There are lots of fake sites. There are lots of sites that are designed to look like popular markets. Um, the, one of the challenge with the onion URLs is they're very long. They're basically a, a hash. And so um, it's very, very hard to spot a fake site um, which can be used to fish your credentials and maybe steal your Bitcoin. Um, a lot of the sites have got multiple mirrors up as well because one of the things with the dark web is it's very slow, it's very unreliable. Um, it can take a very long, you know, it can easily take 30 seconds to access a page because you're going through all this, these network hops. Um, and so actually getting the data out is very, very tedious. It's very slow. It's unreliable. Often these sites, you have to manage a, uh, a user account, a persona, um, and, you know, maybe interact with some of the, the other users of the forum to get credits to be able to access or download content. Um, and just like any marketplace, if you're having to log in every day or every few days to see what's new, just understanding what did I see this, have I seen this already, or is this the new content it can be quite hard. Um, and of course, you know, the bad guys are deploying technology to, to stop the websites being scraped, that they're, they're, they're putting captures in. Uh, some of those sites do get seized by law enforcement. So getting hold of that data um, can be very time consuming and very unreliable. And of course, there's also risks if you're doing this by hand. Uh, there's lots of fake sites, there's lots of fraud there, they can be stealing those login credentials. Um, but also considering your staff welfare, there's lots of very disturbing and illegal com content and images on the, on the site, which is why in, a, in the Scurio platform, we just bring in the plain text um, to, to make it, you know, um, a bit safer for work and not exposing you to any of that malware or any of those, uh, any of those images. So the way the Scurio platform covers this is, um, if you think about the kinds of categories of data that you're wanting to, to monitor for your business, so data about your staff, your infrastructure, your customers, and, and things that are, that are sensitive to your business, what we're doing um, with the dark web monitoring is um, creating a set of search terms around that, which can be as simple as your company name, uh, your, co your corporate email domain, or it could be things like field names, column names, database names that are in your sensitive data, your public IP addresses, your server names, your apps. And you put those into the, the, the digital risk protection platform. We're then monitoring surface deep and dark web. We have automated scrapers and crawlers that are doing this in the cloud. Just to, it's a very simple cloud hosted platform. If we find something new, we generate an alert. Um, again, very easy to consume through email alerting or Slack or Teams integration. And for the more advanced users, we have a REST API. If you want to bring this into some other part of your security network, like a, a SIEM platform or a SOAR platform, uh, or even Office 365, we can, uh, we can integrate there with the API. So that's the concept of how the platform works. Kind of Google, Google for the dark web, Google alerts for the dark web. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Sam, who's going to give you a quick demo of the platform in action. And a reminder, if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A channel um, on, the, uh, on the Zoom. Thanks, Jeremy. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm sharing my screen now, and uh, we should all now be able to see the, um, the dashboard. This is the landing page when we come on to um, secure the DRP, Digital Risk Protection Platform. Um, the, the, the dashboard itself, it's dynamic. It, 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 Basically shows you your, your current set of different current configuration in terms of how many alert monitors you 
um, set up and how many you've got active and you've got a week in and they're triggering and you can filter that by the um the uh, the, the alerts that you've configured but um but broadly speaking the, the platform is split into three different sections as we can see in the navigation bar at the top we have discover analyze and investigate when you would first as an end user navigate into the platform first place you go is into the discover tab and here it's split down into two further sections we have the historical search and we have the create alert monitor so um, as jeremy's already mentioned um, the, what we do is we, we scrape the, the text from the data sources that we identify and, uh, and, and bring that into the platform. The historical search um, effectively allows you to index all of that data that we've ever scraped. Um, the Create Alert Monitor, that's giving you real-time and near real-time alerts when, um, when, when your keywords that you've configured in an alert are triggered on those data sources. We'll jump into the historical search first of all, just to take a look at uh, the, the, the different entities that we can search under and uh, some of the results that we've turned as well. So the different entities for the searching are displayed at the top here, email addresses, IP addresses, keywords, domains, financial information, and an advanced search feature. What these effectively are is pass and matches against um, different entities. By way of example, if I click on email addresses, I could look for my individual email address or an individual individual email address of somebody within my organization um, if, I, if I wanted to. So this could be um, C-suite executives, global admins, that, that, type of, uh, that type of personnel. Or if I wanted to broaden the detection surface, I could just admit any username and I could simply search by purplegrillo.co.uk, which is my fictitious company. Um, that's going to detect for any of my employees' um, email addresses. Um, so it's going to pattern match against the at symbol and the usernames to detect it as if it's an email address uh, within the data sources. I carry out a search and I can see 185 results are displayed there. I have an advanced filter by here so I can sort them by relevance, newest to oldest and by date ranges as well. Um, and I can also sort them by the, uh, the, the data source that's been identified, um, which are categorized in, um, by these, these, these separate icons here. Um, each um, notification will have the icon of the data source that it pertains to next to it here. So we can see that these first two results are data dumps. I'll quickly talk about these uh, the data sources because um, as Jeremy's already mentioned, you can see the dark web is the, the, the topic of today's webinar, um, but we, we, we cover sources beyond that um, that, that, that are relevant to our, to our customers. Um, we have the dark web, of course, so we have dot on the insights. Um, again, we have a team of intelligence on this to Constantly, um, constantly detecting them as they go up, as they go down, as the V2s change into V3 addresses, um, and, uh, and, and and they evade law uh, enforcement. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's an ephemeral task, and our intelligence arms are constantly working our way up that list. Um, bin sites, paste bin, K paste those types of um, sites and code repositories. IRC channels, as already mentioned, curated sources just simply means that uh, one of our intelligence analysts has gone away. And, uh, and scrape that individually as part of an investigation. Data dumps, as we're seeing down here, so this is one of the key data sources that uh, many of our customers care about. Um, this, would, this could be the, um, the, say, the zip file that's released once a ransomware negotiation fails and maybe three, four, five, six months down the line, uh, the ransomware group that, uh, that were uh, the, the perpetrators of that attack um, and, um, and have that breach data, we'll, we'll release it in a zip file, we'll go away and we'll download that uh, we'll pass the data and then we'll bring it into the platform and that's what you're seeing here being indexed by the search. Uh, derived sources, just the nature of our, our unicorn that it could derive to other sources. Again, with all of, the, with all of these data sources, there's metadata explaining um, how that data came to be and, um, and a backstory as to why it's in there. Forums, so this could be surface or dark web forums, but forums um, it, it simply means that um, we need to maintain some sort of persistence in order to get access to those sites. So again, our intelligence analysts um, need to, uh, need to um, retain their, their user accounts in order to, uh, to, to see the activity that occurs on those forums. So it could be with interactions, um, or it could be with posts um, with, with other users, that sort of thing. But we're, we're talking about carding forums, um, we're talking about hacking forums, that, that type of thing. Um, and then the last three here, we have Reddit, we have news sites and Telegram. So these are considered our scraped social sources. So Reddit, obviously, a huge blog. 
But again, it could be um, brand reputation that you care about, or it could be linking to other things, so embedded URLs and hyperlinks within the, um, those blogs. News sites, quite self-explanatory, just RSS feeds from um, major news sites around the world. Um, and then Telegram. So Telegram channels, again, can be more malicious. So sometimes we see um, um, Telegram channels will, will correspond maybe to the dark web forums or marketplaces um, and hacking um, advice and tips or links to leak data sources can be shared within closed channels that, again, as analysts, we sign up to. Um, but looking at some of the data, um, so we, we can see the first two here are our data dumps, and then we can see we've got a dark web um, post here. I'm going to click on the second one, this online uh, spam bot, and just talk about uh, talk about the data that we're seeing here. So when I when I when I click in here, we can see there's uh, there's um, seven email addresses listed. Um, if there were more email addresses, if this was um, hundreds of email addresses, I could click onto the email addresses on the what's inside, and I could filter simply by the the ones that are pertinent to the um, to my organization, the ones that I've searched for in the first place, and I can export all of those as a CSV file. If it, the same would be true for IP addresses or bank card details, if, if that's what I was searching for. Um, but when I look at the, uh, the actual notification itself, I'm going to click on the email metadata, and I've got a backstory here. So this goes back to 2017, and um, a spam bot by the name of Online Spam Bot, hence the title of the notification itself, um, has been identified by a security researcher. As we read down, we can see, um, we can see what, 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 this, uh, what this data dump actually contains. So um, 711 million unique email addresses uh, were in there and their corresponding passwords. And we can see um, there's a summary there of breach included email addresses and passwords. That's implying that it's because intense passwords, otherwise it would say um, hashed passwords. And we can also see a timeline of the dates that this occurred. So um, if this was something I was interested in as a researcher um, or as a, say, a SOC analyst, I wanted to look into this in more detail, I can simply save the message and I can place it into one of my saved message folders. I could create a folder on my name or my company name or the client's name or, or an investigation name or any, anything relevant. I'll add that into the folder. I get a quick link there into the folder that I've saved it into, um, but that will, uh, that will now update in the investigate tab. So if I click on investigate, I go into the general folder, I'll be able to see that, uh, that notification that I've saved. I'll click on uh, I'll click on view details and this creates some more functionality. So within here, I have the ability to ask an analyst to request a takedown and download the data. So the download, I could do that in different formats, CSV, text file, or a docx file. So I could get a white label report if I want and that would be and sectioned off in, in, in assessment and recommendations that I could add in there myself um, if I wanted to share that internally with um, with, um, with, with anybody or, or, or share it with a client, say. Um, request takedown, it's not pertinent to the um, to, to a data dump, it's already happened, it's in the past, there's nothing necessarily to take down. But this could apply, say, to a, a BIM site, um, or a, um, it could also apply to a typo squatted site, which is a feature of our um, of our um, alert monitor, which I will come on to in a moment. Uh, but simply you'd list a justification in there or three sets and you could write uh, a justification in there as to why you believe this should be taken down. Ask an analyst. Um, so ask an analyst, you get some predefined questions or there's an other button. And again, you get free text there. So what this will do is by asking this question in the platform, that will send a notification to our intelligence analyst team who will reply directly to the user who's, who's, who's raised this request. Um, Jeremy has already mentioned earlier, so. Um, you know, you, you likely on um, you know, enterprise environments can be blocked from accessing things like a Tor browser. Um, plus, you may not want to navigate there yourself anyway. It wouldn't be recommended because of the, sort of the, the, the nasty content that resides on, on the dark web. Um, but say this is a dark web post and there's a dark web URL that's listed here. Um, you might want to see that firsthand. So you might want to see a screen grab of that. So you get, again, you might ask an analyst um, to, to provide you a, a screenshot of that and they'll do that via secure. Um, SharePoint link so you can see that. Um, it could be um, anything else really. So it could be, can you tell me more about the threat actor, the ransomware group that this pertains to, um, some, some more general information. Um, and it, it is that, it's that, those types of queries. Um, again, you can use this as an investigation management platform as well. So you can give it a priority. So I can say this is a high priority. I can say it's just occurred. I can say that it's uh, status of in progress. And I could sign this to another user. So it's just me and uh, and a, and a fellow user of myself here. So I can assign this to my, my second user account or, or another user within this account. Um, and I could leave comments here. So I could um, I could communicate between 
for multiple users. Uh, so the way that the platform is structured is um, there's um, one, one account would be um, allocated to, uh, to a customer, but they could have multiple users who access uh, the account and uh, when, when the configuration is made by each user, um, they, um, they can take over both accounts. Um, so um, yeah, that's uh, some of the functionality you get there from the Investigate um, tab. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go into the um, Create Alert Monitors um, and I'll just talk about these. So the entities here are the same as what we've seen already in the uh, historical search. Um, what these are for is for, the, as I say, the real-time alerts um, when, when the keywords that uh, you've configured hit some of those data sources. So if I was to, say, configure an email address alert, as I've already shown you in the historical search, um, I would say, I want everybody in my organization, so that's where I've got UK, I'm going to detect for all of those. Um, or it could be um, Obroadnet, so you can see ProtonMail, very, very commonly used um, for, for dummy email addresses on the dark web. So um, I, this is purposely noisy for the purposes of the demonstration, but um, you give it a give the alert a name, so click on more email alerts. Assign it to a folder, so you can separate them again by folders. It could be different parts of a business, it could be different types of alert, it could be different customers. Um, and then you can also um, do an estimate alert here. So ProtonMail, as I said, it's going to be noisy. So this is doing a, a small historical search of the past 30 days to tell me how often that's likely to trigger. I'm going forward on, on, on our data sources. That's very, very noisy. So because that's so noisy, I might want to refine this. I might want to add some additional keywords to string these together. So I'm looking at the, create the Boolean logic of an AND in, in the string. So it could be proton mail. I only, I only want that say to be mentioned um, with me, with my name. But um, that's relevant. Or it could be an exclusion word. So it could be um, that I don't want that to be mentioned, um, let's say, with the word proton, as say if that was a that was a company. So I can filter up known false positives before the fact. So if I'm happy with this alert, I can also filter by the data sources as well. So I might only want to be seeing dark web and um, paste sites and, and data dump type sites. I'd go on to next and I'd assign this to the users that I want the notifications to be sent to. Um, so I can send this by email or by SMS to those users. I could, we've got a webhook that you can use into Slack. So if you wanted to use them um, to um, ingest all of the notifications into the Slack channel, you can use the, the Slack key there. And we also, of course, have an API so you can ingest this say into a CMOS or solution or, or, or any other um, you know, into, um, Kibana or, or anywhere else you may want to um, be reviewing those messages if, if that's how you want to uh, ingest the data. So yeah, as I say, you can do this for domains and you can do this for IP addresses, keywords. Keywords are classed as more of miscellaneous categories. So it could be um, people's names, BRP's names, it could be physical addresses, it could be telephone numbers, anything that doesn't succinctly fit into one of the other categories. Um, we also have queried sources. So queried sources, uh, this includes some additional data sources. So it includes YouTube, VK, Twitter, and Flickr. Um, the reasons uh, these don't appear on the historical search is because we're reliant upon an API call into these platforms um, in order to um, in order to um, scrape data from there. And um, so what you're doing here is you're effectively configuring an API call into, into those platforms. So for example, if I want to see mentions of my own name on Twitter, um, I could, uh, which is this, and that's going to tell me every every mention of my name on, on, on Twitter. So if it was for, say, VIPs, it could be your brand, it could be anything like that. Uh, but because it's making those one off API calls, um, it, it's not historic, it's not scraping everything in the same way that uh, you would or would on those other data sources already mentioned. Um, I'll talk about type of squatting as well. Um, it's, um, it, 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 it's slightly different to the topic of this webinar on the dark web, but it's no less important and no less threatening to the organization. And it's very, very powerful tool that a lot of our customers um, you know, don't think they get a lot of value from. Um, so typo squatting and what, what we mean when we refer to, to typo squatting is um, the registration of a textually similar domain to your own. Um, so by way of example, if I use our domain, so we are um, if I wanted to, uh, if I wanted to, we're an alert for, for us for type of squatting. So it's doing a uh, type of squatting alert. I configure it in this format. You would omit any TLD, so I don't want the .com there. I would simply put Scurio. Um, what this will do is this will um, do some fuzzy matching behind the scenes. It will switch characters in. It will switch actually characters in and out. It will add characters before and add characters after, and it will change around the TLD. And that, that will um, send me a notification when there's a newly registered or an, or an updated um, domain, who is records are updated for the domain, 
um, that is textually similar to my own. Um, so obviously the reasons why this could be malicious and the reason why this could be an attack vector or threat or threat actor could be used against you. Um, the, the, the most obvious one is for phishing. So for example, if somebody was to register securiozero.com, um, if that came, if there was MX records, if it's mail exchange records associated with that domain and, and, and any email, emails were being sent from there, that could quite easily trick any of my um, employees, it could trick my third parties, it could trick my customers into believing that is me, so it could, you know, phishing emails could be easily sent. Um, these domains as well could be used for um, misdirection, so it could be um, sometimes if the site has a um, some sort of capital portal or a login and you're on the site, um, somebody could, it could be replicating that and um, relying on on those type um, on, the, on, on those typos when domains are being entered that people are going to navigate to the wrong page and start putting in their uh, their usernames, their email addresses, and passwords, and it can be used to harvest it. Could simply be for advertising traffic, and again, it's just trying to misdirect um, traffic that would be going to your website. So, so there's various reasons why this could be malicious. Sometimes they're just going to be parked on mass. Um, um, but again, it, that's not to say that it can be recognised in the future. So um, that's how you um, that's how you configure the alerts in the first place under the Discover tab. I'll quickly jump into the Analyze tab and I'll look at the um, the alert monitors. These are for the um, these are to review the, the the alert monitors that have been configured already. I'll go into the Examples folder. So within here, you've got the ability to um, edit, um, delete, review. Um, and, um, and pause so the, the active alerts that you've got running. Um, so you can see these multiple alerts that I've um, previously configured um, in, the, in this demo account. But if I go on the type of script and alert, just to give you an example, in here I can see that I've, uh, I've configured a, um, a type of alert for Barclays, so Barclays uh, the bank. So barclays.co.uk is the legitimate um, domain for Barclays. And I'm going to look on the view messages to see some of the, the previous messages that um, the previous domains that have been registered. So this gives you the um, the detailed view. We can, uh, which includes um, partially the clear date uh, details there. But I could look on the compressed view there and, and look at the, just the domains themselves as they as they registered. So we can see one here, look, BarclaysBank.co. That could be very very fishy. Very 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 easily used to um to, to misdirect some of my customers. But we can we can look on some of the additional features here for further analysis. So we have an advanced filter bar here where we can add parameters. But if we look on the timeline, we can actually filter by the timeline. So we can see here a spike. So um, there's 14 results that occurred on the 20th of November. So that could be indicative of some larger attack that's occurring. So I could filter in by that date range if I just want to look around that sort of time. I could just leave it as it is. But when I look on the insights, um, again, I can see the pattern that was matched. So I can see the different um, the, the different matching criteria here that's been used. So switching characters in and out. But I might want to look at the um, the type of the domains that were using the original title Barclays. So I'll cross in by Barclays. And again, I might only be interested in the original TLD, so .co.uk. So I'll click on .co.uk and I'll look at the results. That, that leaves me with twelve remaining results. I can see here we've got Meta Barclays and Metaverse Barclays. They're clearly parked because obviously the the rise of the metaverse, people are trying to monetize on the fact that Barclays may want to purchase those domains in, in the future. But if we look down here, we can see Barclays Bank London.co.uk. Again, that's very, very fishy. And if, if, if that hasn't been, um, if there's an active site there, well, that site is not for sale, that's going to be a concern to, to the bank. Uh, so so uh, they, they would want to actively take this down. If I uh, view the result, again, I can save that message, place it into the general folder. I'll navigate to that folder. That will populate as the, the top message. I'll click on the view details and I, I may want to request that be taken down. Um, so these are package dependent. Um, there, there, there is a cost behind um, the request takedowns. But again, this could be, again, sensitive. It, it could be a phishing or fraud. I'd say that's a strong justification there. Um, and, and I could add details in there. I'd submit that request and that will go through to one of our intelligence analysts who, who would action that on, uh, on your behalf. And follow that from forming until it's been taken down. So um, it's just another feature that the, that the platform uh, the platform um, has. So um, yeah, that stage I, I will I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing and um, and uh, I'll, 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 I'll open it up for any any questions. Thanks very much, Sam. 
So yeah, happy to take any uh, any questions while we wrap up. So you can either put them in the Q and A or um, into the into the chat. There was one in chat actually um, about can we delete data from the dark web? Yeah, good question. I, I think the, the 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 general answer is no. I mean, as, as I talked about, the the dark websites themselves are. Um, are, are hard to trace down to, to trace so it's very it's it's very difficult for law enforcement or anyone else to discover exactly where those servers are they do they do get traced they do get seized by law enforcement but um uh so so in general you can't get something taken down from the actual dark web but a lot of data does get leaked onto surface sites like forums chat rooms pace sites where it is possible to get it taken down there are other approaches we've used <coughs> in the past to um, uh, where data has been hosted on the dark web, which, um, which have, uh, where we've been able to actually put up dummy data on the dark web to try and be a bit of a smoke screen. So even if your data is being hosted out there, there are things you can do to try and deflect um, the people from finding the genuine data. So a lot of the data that gets dumped is very large, can be you know many gigabytes, very in some cases terabytes. Um, and so there are things you can do, like um, uh, posting lookalike data deliberately, just to try and um, make people give up and, uh, and not bother downloading these uh, these big files. Um, so just to just to quickly wrap up, then I think you know what we've seen is businesses all sizes, including small and medium companies, are now at increased risk through through their supply chains. The dark web itself is now even more anonymous, harder to trace and take down those sites. Um, ransomware is a big issue for people. Um, but you know, most businesses can't afford to do this and they don't have the, the, the time or the expertise or the budget. And that's why the automated monitoring platforms from, from Scurio, as you've seen, are very easy to use. They're very affordable. Um, and so we provide that capability to, to have a, a pair of eyes and ears outside the firewall that's uh, looking for your data, looking for threats to your to your business. So at that point, I think I'll hand back to you, Naresh. Hi, <clears throat> thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so, um, you know, I presume that, you know, we've answered all your questions. I'm still encouraging us more, or what you can do is email me and I will coordinate. Um, I just wanna wrap this up by saying, hope everyone found the session very informative and exciting. As you can see, the solution offering in the next step is we can then set up a larger call with your colleagues to enable them to position them to your end customers and eventually make a sale. So I highly encourage you to please get in touch with us and um, look forward to uh, more positive feedback uh, from the audience. If there are no other further questions, I would like to end this session by wishing you a pleasant day. Um, and, um, and, and if there's some more, some more questions, as I mentioned earlier, please get back to me on this one. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>